Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. Done a lot of videos today, but when you're on a roll, uh, I guess you should just keep going. So I want to talk about this report uh, by the Climate uh, Crisis Advisory Group, CCAG. Uh, this report was produced um, just before the COP28 um, in Dubai. Um, you know, it's nice to have deadlines, right? And the COP was a deadline. It's on the overshoot, basically overshooting the 1.5 threshold and finding our way back. So now that we're over 1.5, there's going to be <laughs> a lot of talk of how do we get back to 1.5, you know, as we rapidly approach two and higher, higher values. Now the overshoot, um, there's a book called Overshoot, it's uh, an amazing book. It's Overshoot, the Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change. So it talks about carrying capacity, the cornucopian myth, euphoric belief in limitless resources, carrying capacity, maximum permanently supportable load, drawdown, stealing resources from the future, cargoism, delusion that tech will always save us from overshoot. Overshoot is a growth beyond an area's carrying capacity, quite simply, crash, die off. And this is, of course, by William Catton Jr. Um, there's a preview, um, I'll, the link will be in the blurb. Overshoot, the Ecological Basis of Revolutionary Change by William Catton. Um, and it was published in 1982. And it's a, it's a, it's a superbly fantastic book. So that's the idea of overshoot. This overshoot report is overshoot going above 1.5 and then coming back down. Um, so basically, uh, you know, although this was a recent report, it still talks about, you know, remaining within the 1.5 guardrail. So we'll ignore that sort of stuff. I mean, we're at 1.5 already. They talk about us being at 1.1 or 1.2 now. Well, 2023, we're at 1.5. So we won't talk about some of that stuff, but we'll talk about, you know, how, you know, what the group is looking at. And, uh, you know, they're saying that it's very, very risky to be over 1.5 because we approach all of these tipping points. And one of the reports that was released uh, for the COP is all on tipping points, and that's going to be a whole bunch of videos, and I'll cover that in great detail because that's one of my most interesting sort of areas that I like to look at, tipping points in the climate system. You know, abrupt climate change is caused by tipping points. So this report is you know, the, the foreword is written by Johan Rockström, who's the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And uh, so let's see what they say. Well, they talk about the 1.5 threshold. So on December 12th, uh, 2015, 196 parties at the UN Climate Conference, COP21, I was there in Paris adopted a legally binding international treaty on climate change known as the Paris Agreement. It entered force on 4th of November 2016. Its overarching goal was to hold the increase of the global average temperature to well below two above pre-industrial levels and pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. Well, they failed, right? We're at 1.5. But it was a historic, durable, and ambitious um, agreement. Um, and uh, yeah, basically it says here, perhaps what no one could foresee was just how quickly the world would be contemplating the crossing of the thresholds and limits. Well, <laughs> we've crossed, as I say enough, you know, I can't say it enough times, we've crossed 1.5. Um, yeah, so there we are. And you know, the continued warming increases the likelihood of crossing various climate tipping points. Again, I said I'll be talking about those um, in the massive, when I talk about the massive report called Tipping Points by Exeter University, produced for the same conference, basically, for COP28.
So these tipping points can trigger cascading and potentially irreversible harm to ecosystems, human health, food security, water availability, and social stability. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go over the details of that. So not if, but when, um, crossing 1.5. And uh, yeah, now although the report uh, doesn't, certainly doesn't uh, say we've already reached it or passed it, that's what I'm saying. That's what James Hansen is saying. That's what the data seems to be saying. So why am I talking about this report at all? Because there's lots of other good information in it. Um, there's information about, there's talk about the, well, <laughs> the, the rallying cry. It wasn't at COP26. Maybe it started then to keep 1.5 alive. You know, that rally was going on at COP28, you know, and, uh, you know what happened a month later? We we basically the numbers came in for 2023 and we're above 1.5 for that year. Talk about the exponential growth of renewables. In 2020, one in 25 cars sold was electric. By 2025, this was one in five. Didn't know it was that fast. The amount of renewable energy generating capacity added during 2023 of 500 gigawatts will exceed all previous records. Okay, uh, finding a way back. Well, they talk about um, at CCAG, they have this 4R planet strategy, um, which is reduction, removal, repair, and resilience. There's growing scientific consensus that we are on course to exceed 1.5 in the not too distant future. Yeah, well, we've reached it, okay. What is the overshoot? Why does it matter? Um, they talk, you know, I've talked a bit about that. This is the schematic temperature pathways. Peaking at 1.5 and declining, not happening. Delayed start and stabilizing at 1.5, not happening. Remaining below and stabilizing at 1.5, not happening. We're here, we're overshooting it. So the point is how do we minimize the amount of overshoot and bring it back down to 1.5? as quickly as possible right so that's what talk will turn to meanwhile we're rocketing to two degrees already okay and we're likely to hit that within 10 15 years 15 years according to hansen um acknowledging the overshoot yeah well people really need need to acknowledge the overshoot it's ironic that it's happened and this report is not acknowledging the overshoot but this report was written for cop so it was a couple months, a month or two before now, so before the overshoot. Yes, every fraction of a degree matters. Um, present tense, the impact of over 1.1, well, that should say 1.5 now. I mean, this, so the report needs to be, it'll be rewritten soon. It'll be interesting to see next year's report before COP, what that says. Um, and I'm not going to, basically, I'm looking at the different sections transgressing planetary boundaries so the the climate institute talks about these cl planetary boundaries first described in 2009 you know scientific health check of the planet nine interlinked planetary boundaries to find a safe operating space for humanity we've already passed a bunch of these boundaries the boundaries are climate change change in the biosphere bio geochemical flows, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, stratospheric ozone depletion, ocean acidification, freshwater change, land system change, atmospheric aerosol loading, and novel entities like synthetic substances and microplastics. I guess AI should be another planetary boundary, should be involved in there somewhere. Um, in 2009, three out of the nine planetary boundaries were crossed. 14 years later, um, many other ones have been passed. A further three boundaries have been crossed. So at least six of the nine have been crossed. Ocean acidification is another one that's very close, if not passed, aerosol loading and so on. Okay, so if you want to have security, prosperity and equity for human humanity on earth, you have to come back into the safe space. And we're not seeing the progress currently. In the world remember you know how a few years ago the big thing was we need, we need a safe space this is a safe space to talk 
Is this a safe space to comment? Well, uh, you know, there's no safe space in the world <laughs> for, with, with abrupt climate change, right? Uh, weakening of planetary resilience, degrees of uncertainty. Um, yeah, at this stage, you know, You know, at this stage, we're heading to two, two and a half, three, three and a half, four. You know, the doubling, the climate sensitivity appears to be 4.8 plus or minus 1.2, according to Hansen. That's between 3.6 Celsius and 6 Celsius. Right. So we're rocketing above all of these things. So, uh, you know, there's still good, some good information in, in this, in this report, but, um, I, you know, the, the the rate that climate change is accelerating, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's already outdates this report, even though it's just a few months old now. Talk about five different levers um, that Potsdam is assessing. Carbon dioxide removal and storage underground, carbon dioxide removal using land, reduction in carbon intensity of energy production, Changing energy demand, fewer methane emissions. Those are some of the things they're looking at. Uh, you know, reality checks. Yeah, very important. Um, the risks of going over 1.5, which we were here, the tipping points. You know, those include loss of winter sea ice, well, summer sea ice first, and then Arctic winter sea ice, collapse of Greenland ice sheet of the boreal permafrost, dieback of Amazon rainforest, die off of low level, low latitude coral reefs, and the collapse of the West and Antar East Antarctic ice sheet. So many of these things are already underway and some have even happened, right? You know, the domino effect. Ah, here we go. This is one of the best lines in the whole report. What happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. That's familiar to me. Where have I heard that before? Actually, I came up with that term many years ago. I should have trademarked it or copyrighted it and then charged, got royalties from these guys for using my phrase. But anyway, sour grapes. Um, different scenarios and so on. I want to go down to the... We're almost there. Um, <laughs> this is funny. Analysis shows that tropical cyclones have a negative impact on the GDP of affected countries for more than 15 years. Really? Okay. There's one tropical cyclone that would have a positive effect on GDP, and I think that would be a cyclone that might hit uh, uh, a certain uh, residence in, in Florida. I won't mention whose residence and where. Uh, da, 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 Global stock take process, you know, yeah, we're in trouble. That's the result of the global stock take process. Uh, they talk about the, the UAE, COP28, the, some of the goals and stuff. This was, again, just put out just before. The planetary strategy, planet strategy for our reduction, removal, repair, resilience, uh, and uh, actions and intervention. So let's just have a look at this, what they're saying about some of the technology-based carbon capture. So we got carbon capture and storage, separate carbon, CO2 from other gases in industrial processes or capture carbon from the burning of fossil fuels in power generation stations, compress it, put it to a storage site, inject it into subterranean rock formations. They're trying this in Iceland where it, it changes into rock fairly quickly. Direct air capture, okay. Um, geological sequestration. Uh, the big buzzword of course is nature-based solutions, natural climate solutions like land-based forest uh, reforestation, rewilding, mangrove regeneration, seagrass de de uh, stuff, sustainable rice cultivation, intensification of sustainable agriculture, increased biodiversity on the land in the oceans, restoring apex of species in the oceans, like whale populations. Whales are huge for the ocean. 
whale populations fertilize the ocean, support vast biodiverse marine populations. I'll do a whole whale uh, video at some point soon. Interestingly and good, they mention SRM, solar radiation management. They talk about marine cloud brightening and they talk about stratospheric uh, sulfate aerosol injection. Um, and uh, but they say that the following report, the next version, the next CAG, CC CAG report uh, will be on uh, climate intervention. So that's going to be one to watch. Um, and uh, yeah, they say that the world could not afford not to consider all its available options. You know, they don't really like SRM, but they want to they don't want to exclude it. So that's good. Then they give an example of some unintended consequence from China and so on. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah. So there's some good information in this report. I think the next report on climate interventions will be even uh, even more interesting to to me and uh, maybe to many people because this this report will be overlooked a lot because you know it's act it's it's basically we're already at 1.5. Although, you know, they will argue that we have to be at 1.5 for 10 years and then we'll be at 1.5. So they're saying, well, OK, if that's the case, we'll be there in four years. OK, so, you know, let's take the uh, let's say we have to be at 1.5 for 100 years or let's change the baseline. Let's go to, you know, keeping 1.5 alive means let's go to baseline three. Let's set a new baseline 1970 to 2000 and base temperatures on that, yeah, then we're well under 1.5. You know, you might think I'm joking, but the baseline everybody's using now is 1850 to 1900, except Hansen uses 1880 to 1920. Um, but that's baseline two. Baseline one is 1750. It was that baseline that was referenced when the two degree and 1.5 degree numbers were first used by reports and climate reports. Okay, so anyway, uh, thanks for uh, watching. Please go to paulbeckwith.net and donating to my PayPal to support my research and videos. Okay, bye for now.